Welcome to a new episode of the ITU Journal webinar series, where you can find insights and forward-looking research on future and evolving technologies. The ITU Journal is an international journal providing complete coverage of all communications and networking paradigms, free of charge for both readers and authors. This publication considers yet-to-be-published papers addressing fundamental and applied research, building bridges between disciplines, connecting theory with application, and stimulating international dialogue. Its interdisciplinary approach reflects ITU's comprehensive field of interest and explores the convergence of ICT with other disciplines. We count on your support to make this webinar an interesting experience. Please submit your questions via the Q&A channel at the bottom of your screen. All questions from the audience will be taken during the Q&A session after the talk. The meeting is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the webinar website. Closed captioning is also available for this. Event. You can enable this by clicking on the closed caption icon at the bottom of your screen. We hope that you will enjoy the talk and we encourage you to stay connected until the end for the wisdom corner. I will now give the floor to our master of ceremonies. Hello. And welcome to the webinar series with academics of the ITU Journal on Future and Evolving Technologies. My name is Alessia Magliarditi from ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, the United Nations Specialized Agencies for Information and Communication Technologies. It is my pleasure to open today our webinar with Professor Carla Fabiana Chiasterini, Politecnico di Torino, Italy. We count on your support to make this webinar an interesting experience. So please submit your question via the Q&A channel. We will address them to our speaker during the Q&A session. After the session, as just announced by our avatar, I will moderate the Wisdom Corner live life lessons. So please uh, stay online. Professor Chiasserini agreed to a personal chat. She will share with us some lessons learned over the years that might perhaps be useful for some of you. Very pleased now to introduce Professor Iana Kildi, Editor-in-Chief of the ITU Journal and Founder and President of Truva from the United States. Professor Achilles is Ken Byers, Chair Professor in Telecommunications Emeritus at the Georgia Institute of Technology. He has established many research centers worldwide, including in South Africa, in Spain, in Saudi Arabia and Finland. He is Editor-in-Chief Emeritus of Impact Factor Journals highly cited and at the top of the most prestigious international rankings, visiting distinguished professor in several universities around the world. His current research interests are in 6G, 7G wireless communication systems, hologram communication, terahertz communication, molecular communication, internet of bio nano things, intelligent surfaces, nano networks, Internet of Things in Challenged Environments, and many, many other subjects. So, Professor Akildit, the floor is yours for your opening remarks to introduce our speaker and moderate the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Alessia. When I was listening to you, I remembered the first time we met, uh, it was, I guess, in St. Petersburg, almost 10 years ago, 2014. 
uh, during the kaleidoscope and we kept in touch and uh, we started the journal together as you know and i really enjoy the work with you and it's a really great pleasure that we came this far together so uh, greetings from abu dhabi to all around the world i welcome you all to our it journal for future and evolving technologies webinar series yet we have another very promising speaker today professor carlo fabiana chiasserini from Politecnico di Torino, one of the top three universities in Italy. Before I present Carla, I would like to briefly talk about our journal. The objective of our journal is to bring the academic and industrial worlds together in order to establish a strong bridge between academia and industry. The idea for our journal was initiated back in December 2019, when Alessia and then her boss, Chasup Lee, we're visiting Georgia Tech for Kaleidoscope Conference, and uh, we started to talk about the journal. And then finally, we established it, and the first inaugural issue was published back in December 2020 during the COVID times. It is an open access journal, no fees for readers, no fees for authors. The papers go through a rigorous review process, and we try to cover all fro forefront and time research activities in the academic and industrial world. In case you hear some uh, noises with the race cars, because my hotel is sitting on the top of the Formula One racetrack here in Abu Dhabi. So sorry about the noises. So the journal is a product of big team effort, effort and I would like to acknowledge them here. Sijo Onoa San, Bilal Jamusi, Alessia Malarditi, and Erika Campilongo, and also are uh, both Marias who joined us recently and many others for their work, efforts and continued support and dedication for the success of our journal. I encourage you all to submit your papers and also if you have ideas for special issues on popular topics, please do not hesitate to contact us. Today, I have the great pleasure to present you our speaker, Professor Carla Fabiana Chiasserini. First of all, on behalf of our entire journal team, I personally thank Carla for accepting our invitation and giving this webinar today. Carla and I go back to more than a couple decades, although she's younger than me, a couple decades younger than me. We always stayed in touch. I followed her career with keen interest. Carla is a full professor at Politecnico di Torino, Italy, and a research associate with the Italian National Research Council, in short form CNR and the National Inter-University Consortium for Telecommunications in short form CNIT or CNIT, CNIT. She's also a WASP guest professor. I really don't know what WASP stands for, but at Chalmers Institute of Technology, Sweden, I visit that place. It's also one of the top universities in Sweden. She was a visiting researcher at UC San Diego uh, between 1998 and 2003, almost more than 20 years ago, and a visiting professor at Monash University in Australia, 2012 and 2016, and Berlin Technische Universität, 2021 and 2022, and also HPI, Potsdam University, also in Germany, 2023. As you see, she's international, well-connected, and uh, she loves to travel. <laughs> That's why we share that interest. She's a fellow of the IEEE, and a distinguished member of ICM, ACM. Her research interests include next generation networks, edge computing, resource allocation, and networking for machine learning. She has published over 350 journal articles and referred conference pa refereed conference papers, and she has received several awards for her scientific work. As of May 2024, his, her Google Scholar H index is 58, and her total number of citations is uh, uh, several thousand. I put there 58, but it's like more than, I don't know, 40, 50,000 citations. Currently, she serves as vice editor-in-chief of the Computer Communications Journal. I think it is from Elsevier as an editor-at-large of the IEEE ACM Transactions on Networking. Carla is also a member of the steering committee of the IEEE Transactions on Network Science and Engineering and of the ACM Mobihawk Conference. 
For many years, Carla has served on the editorial board of journals such as IEEE Transactions Wire Communications and IEEE Transactions and Mobile Computing. And she has been a guest editor for many diverse special issues for many, many journals. Carla is and has been involved in many national and international research projects, either as a coordinator or as a PI. She is currently the coordinator for Politecnico di Torino of a major national research initiatives in the field of telecommunications and a member of the Board of Governors of the Restart, Restart Research Foundation. She's a member of the Scientific Council of CCTC, which is a research center in the, in the south of Barcelona in Spain, and also of IMDA, which is a, another research center in Madrid, Spain. She serves on the 6G RIC research initiative in Germany. Without further ado, let us listen to the exciting talk entitled The Prize of Distributed Machine Learning. Again, thanks, Carla. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. It's a pleasure for me, an honor to be here. So thank you for having me. Thank you, and Alessia, and the all ITU Journal Webinar Seminar. Um, so let me share my slides. Okay. And as you mentioned, um, yeah, my research is uh, supported by Restart, this is research initiative in, uh, in Italy. And in particular, I'm coordinating the activity on programmable networks. And as you said, besides Polytechnic and Torino, I think um, I have the privilege to be also supported by the Valenberry Fellowship at Chalmers University of Technology. So this talk, as you said, is about machine learning, which is a very popular topic, as we, as we know. But in particular, we are going to look at some aspects that relate to distributed machine learning. And as we know, machine learning is a very powerful approach. But what we will discuss today is also the impact that, in particular, distributed machine learning will have on um, the network and computing platforms and uh, I see advantages and disadvantages that we may have and the approaches that we can adopt in order to make machine learning and in particular distributed machine learning more sustainable. So let me start with some introduction and, and motivation for this talk and also uh, let's introduce this um, uh, research that I've been doing in the last few years and how it has evolved uh, from uh, some initial exploration uh, and applications of machine learning um, till more, let's say, advanced uh, topics and aspects in uh, especially the uh, support that networks can provide to machine learning. So machine learning, as we know, is really pervasive. We can find it essentially everywhere. It has been used to study the, uh, for example, uh, people, uh, mobility, the propagation um, environment in, uh, in different uh, scenarios. Uh, so all uh, these applications that relate also to the optimization or the configuration of Red interfaces and network services are often based on machine learning. And here we have an example taken from a white paper by Nokia, Nokia Bell Labs, uh, that refers to the concept of semantic communications, which is another uh, very popular and very interesting uh, aspect and where machine learning uh, has proved to be extremely useful. So thanks to machine learning, it is of course a data-driven approach. Um, we can uh, essentially identify what is important to transfer from a transmitter to a receiver and how to transmit the most relevant, most important uh, information towards the receiver. And then on the receiver, of course, we need still uh, machine learning in order to reconstruct the all information that our application needs. Uh, but besides 
um, what we call network services that can benefit greatly from machine learning. Of course, machine learning is also often an essential component of applications like in uh, e-health, in the e-health dom domain, or surveillance, uh, use of drones uh, or uh, UAVs, or uh, automated and connected vehicles. And uh, in most of these domains, uh, it is extremely important to act on a short time span. So what we need is real-time processing. And this is something important that we need to underline. But the other thing that I would like to highlight um, is the fact that machine learning and, uh, of course, all applications and services that exploit machine learning uh, give us the possibility to customize um, the service or the application to the specific needs of users when we have human uh, users, so to the specific individuals, as well as to the needs of the specific devices, uh, whenever our, let's say, end user is an IoT uh, device. So this is quite a powerful concept that um, also makes a difference between what we call 6G and uh, what essentially was uh, 5G. While 5G was more prone to provide quality of service for certain uh, categories of applications or, or services, so we had the concept uh, of network slicing. In NCG, we have a more user-centric perspective and the focus is very often, as I was saying, uh, on the specific needs of the end user. And this is possible if we have, of course, data that characterize our user and data that we can use through a machine learning approach to indeed um, personalize the service or the application. Um, so some observations that we can start making based on what we said and what we can observe by looking at current services and applications. Very often, what we mentioned as main applications or services will require the use of deep neural networks. Deep neural networks are, as the name says, uh, neural networks that include several layers. So they are typically quite complex. And uh, this means that clearly uh, being these models complex, they will require uh, a considerable amount of resources. Um, resources that can be networking resources, but also computational resources, so memory, the usage of CPU or a GPU, and as a consequence, energy. So this is a very important point because the consumption of resources due to the uh, execution or the training of machine learning models um, can be extremely high. And uh, there are some researchers from me, ours, uh, who actually quantified the energy consumption of large language models um, to be comparable to essentially the uh, environment footprint due to a car of an average size over the whole lifetime of, of this car. And uh, actually there are so complex models that this consumption is much higher than that. So these of course are a specific type of models, but just to give an idea, about the uh, potential uh, resource requirement of a machine learning model. And as we mentioned already, very often we need real-time processing. This means that whenever, for example, 
neural networks, machine learning models are used for decision making, and we need uh, to have a decision and output of the model uh, within a very short time, then we need a lot of CPU or GPU in order to, of course, obtain this output out of the, of the uh, neural network. And um, of course, uh, whenever we use a machine learning model, we need to have data available. So data that, as we said, are very often related to the end users. They may be IoT devices, but they may be also human users. So there are privacy concerns that may relate to this data and their usage. And this is another not important point, of course, that we have in machine learning. But let me uh, dig a little bit more uh, deeper in uh, each of these aspects. Let's start with DNNs, just to be all on the same page. So deep neural networks, as we said, are quite complex models composed of several layers. This is an example of a classificator, image classification, where we have as an input the image, for example, of an animal. And the goal is to classify in the, the animal that is represented in the image. So here we have three possible classes, dog, bird, and, and cat. Of course, this is just an example, but essentially it gives us the opportunity to explain a little bit about uh, uh, how we need to work with these networks. So first of all, we need to train our network. That means that uh, in the case of the so-called supervised learning, we have a data set where there are uh, images, and uh, these are the samples that we can use during training when uh, the network should indeed learn. And uh, each sample, each image is labeled with the right, correct class associated to that. So given this initial data set that is used for training, we give these samples, these images essentially as input to our network. And then through, for example, a stochastic gradient descent method, we can train the network to learn and to provide um, correct, essentially, responses with respect to the input that is provided. And of course, given the training data set, uh, we know the ground truth. So we can essentially uh, provide feedback to the network um, whether the output has been correct or not. So during this training process, we let the network learn. And typically, this methodology implies that we have a, a forward pass, that is, we provide a sample of the input and then we provide the output, and then a backward pass during which the gradients are actually passed from uh, right to, to left. The training may take um, quite a long time. It depends on the complexity, of course, of the network. It depends on the training data set. And this means that uh, if it lasts for a long time, it will also uh, consume computational resources, in particular, uh, for example, a CPU. And the larger, the deeper our network, the more complex the neural network, the heavier, essentially, typically, the uh, training process is. Now, given that, as we mentioned also before, uh, we expect that with the um, increase in the complexity of our models, we'll have an increase also in the resource consumption. And here are some data, again, just to give an idea uh, of the amount of resources that are necessary. For example, in this case, we are considering connected uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. They can be battery uh, based or, or uh, uh, the more traditional vehicles. 
And uh, in all cases, you can see that, of course, it depends on, uh, let's say, how much the vehicle uh, is automated and, and connected. Uh, but the percentage in gas emissions that are due to these additional equipment that is necessary to make our vehicle uh, autonomous is not negligible at all. And uh, of course, uh, autonomous vehicles uh, heavily uh, rely on uh, machine learning uh, for uh, the automation of all their functions. So, this is indeed something that should uh, make us aware of the price in terms of energy consumption of our machine learning uh, approaches. And uh, as we said, we need real-time processing for many applications of interest. So whenever we need real-time, well then um, we need to act exploiting resources that are close to the end users. So given the network and computing system that, as we may know, is composed of different tiers from the cloud to the edge, to the edge devices, it would be actually very convenient for a real-time processing to operate at the edge of the network and computing infrastructure or at the edge devices. But on the other hand, if we look at the servers that are at the edge of the infrastructure or at the end devices, those are the kind of entities that have uh, less resources in terms of memory and computing capability. So we have often a mismatch between what is the resource demand of a machine learning model and what is the resource availability uh, that we have at the edge devices or at the edge of the infrastructure. And this is clearly an issue that we need to face. So here are our challenges that we need, we need to, to address and uh, our research efforts and the research efforts of the community uh, has tried indeed to solve. So the need for uh, computing energy resources, uh, the need also to involve in uh, the training and the execution of our machine learning models, the devices that are at the edge or the so-called far edge uh, for real-time processing, but also because uh, these um, devices that are at the edge of the network uh, are there with their resources and would be indeed a pity not to exploit them. Right. So from a sustainability point of view, it is also important to involve these kind of devices. But as we said, whenever we need to train a machine learning model or to use a machine learning model, so we have the so-called execution or inference uh, stage, well, then we may need more resources than those that can be offered by our edge devices. So possible solutions, um, intuitively, we can, uh, of course, say, well, let's use a leverage cooperation because it is true that the resources offered by the single device may not be enough to train or to execute a machine learning model that is quite complex. But if we, in a way, federate the resources that these devices offer, well, then we can actually perform the stages, different stages of the AI ML pipeline successfully. And uh, this is indeed uh, true. And split computing that we will uh, introduce as a paradigm in a, in a minute will actually allow us to do that. So um, 
that's one strategy. Cooperation, however, also means that we can try and reuse models that have been trained uh, for other applications or for other services or in other environments uh, by other groups of nodes. That's essentially at the basis of the concept of transfer learning. Uh, but there is also an emerging uh, concept that we have introduced that we named the crowdsourcing machine learning, where indeed we can exploit uh, different approaches to combine uh, models, machine learning models that have been trained by others. We can combine this knowledge by aggregating these models, and then we can tailor the size of these models to the resource availability in the nodes where these models needs to be, need to be used. So we will uh, see actually a uh, possible technique that we can use in order to indeed tailor a machine learning model to the uh, resource that are available uh, on our, our nodes. Uh, and we will discuss this a bit later. The second solution that we can offer, uh, it's not just cooperation, but also this interesting concept of dynamic neural networks that uh, have uh, actually, uh, uh, that has emerged uh, lately. And uh, uh, it is indeed, I think, a very interesting and can be um, uh, valuable also future research direction for uh, for uh, our community. So let me start with uh, the first concept that is leveraging uh, cooperation. So sorry for that. Um, and in particular, leveraging cooperation for uh, the learning phase. That means the training of our machine learning model. And here we know that we have distributed paradigms that have been proposed that are very powerful. And one of them, the most popular one, is federated learning. So let me start from the vanilla version of the learning, just a brief recap uh, to be all on the same page. In the case of federated learning, it means that we have a bunch of clients that are um, nodes. Uh, with computational and networking capabilities. Here in this picture, we consider vehicles, but they can be, of course, edge servers or other kinds of devices. And there is a coordinator or aggregator that here we think um, as an edge server. And these clients have all the same machine learning model to train. And what we can have is that indeed the server is the one that provides the same model, and this is important, the same model to each client, so that each client can locally train this model using its own data. And then each client will return the model that has been locally trained to the server. The server can aggregate the different versions of the model by averaging the weights, for example, of the um, models that it has received, so that it will get a new model that can then be resent to the clients, and the clients can repeat the uh, procedure of locally training the model and then send it back to the server and so on. So each of these phases is called epoch. And uh, in order to reach convergence, to have essentially a, a well-trained model, we typically need several epochs. So several of these exchanges between the server and the clients. Now, this is a very clever paradigm that, for example, addresses the issue of data privacy, because in this case, the clients do not have to share their data 
with, with uh, others or with the server. So that's important. And at the same time, uh, it gives the possibility to essentially distribute the training process so that we exploit the resources of different clients uh, at the edge, for example, uh, in order to let our model uh, learn properly. So all these are great advantages. And indeed, um, federated learning, as we know, has been extremely successful. Uh, let me now introduce the concept of split computing, and then we'll see how federated learning and split computing can be actually combined together. So split computing means in machine learning means that we can, given a machine learning model, um, separate this machine learning model into different blocks. And then we can actually uh, train these different portions of the model at different nodes. Uh, this is, of course, the concept of split computing during training. Similarly, the concept of split computing can be applied to inference. So whenever we need to use an already trained machine learning model, again, we can consider that we have different portions of the model uh, being executed at different nodes so that we split essentially the computing load uh, of training or inference. And here is again an example where we have a, a classification task where the input is an image and our network needs to produce an output essentially gives the class, the, the identify, for example, the animal in the image and we have um, a car as a device and an edge server. And we can consider that the machine learning model to be used for our classification task can actually be uh, split in uh, two parts, into blocks. One, the simplest one, uh, to be run uh, at the uh, device, while uh, the heavier portion of the model will be executed at the edge. And of course, um, the client and the edge will need to exchange um, some information in order to perform uh, the classification task. So we need, of course, uh, a first um, computing operation at the edge, and then the edge will send this intermediate output uh, sorry, at the device, and then the device will send this intermediate output to the edge. The edge will take that as an input to the second portion of the machine learning model and produce the classification output. Now, why are we introducing this split computing paradigm? Because as I mentioned, it is actually possible and convenient in some cases to combine federated learning and split computing. How is it possible where there is actually a recent uh, work that will be presented at this year Infocom by uh, Bao Chun Li et al that essentially uh, provides uh, a methodology in order to combine these two concepts. You can recognize here the server and the clients that we explained uh, um, what they do and the role in federated learning, but you can see that there are some additional blocks, these autograd bridge that allow essentially the clients to communicate, to exchange information. Uh, why? Because in this case, uh, what they proposed is indeed that each client has a different portion, a different set of layers of, for example, a deep neural network. And uh, what they do in this case is to learn each 
its own portion of the model. So differently from the standard, let's say, federated learning paradigm, uh, here the clients do not have the same model, but each of them has a different portion of it. So the client, client one, will, for example, train the initial portion of the model and, and then send for the forward pass, of course, the information to client two that will use that and then uh, train the second portion of the model and then send its output to client three. And then, of course, we need the backward uh, past the back propagation as also shown in this in this figure. And then when uh, the model has been properly trained, each client will essentially send its own portion that has been trained locally to the server. So we have the possibility in the, as we mentioned, to combine these, these two uh, paradigms. So let me now um, highlight uh, what may be some issues, some drawbacks, if you like, in uh, actually both federated learning and also in this new version of federated learning plus split computing. So first of all, it has been already observed in the literature that one issue that we may have in this case is the fact that by involving different nodes, um, so clients with different characteristics, different uh, resources, uh, uh, resource availability, uh, some of them may be faster, others may be slower. And uh, this may create problems. So for example, if we go back to our previous picture, think of client two as a slow client, then clearly that would be kind of bottleneck, right? That will slow down the uh, overall process. And this actually uh, may happen also in the standard, let's say if the, the vanilla version of federated learning. So uh, some researchers have uh, um, addressed this problem that is typically referred to as asynchronous federated learning because not all clients will send back to the server the result of their local training at the same time. But indeed, they will take different um, time to, to do that. Second, we have that depending on the data set that is available that the different clients can use, uh, we may have different performance in terms of convergence of the learning training process. So when the clients have, let's say, data locally that are uh, distributed more or less in the same way, so similarly, well, then the process is quite smooth. Um, the model can be trained uh, in a relatively, let's say, short time, and the training process essentially converges quickly. When instead the clients own data sets that are non-ID, so differently distributed, then we may have actually issues. And we'll see more on, on this in a minute. Uh, the third issue is instead of a hand. So this is quite intuitive by looking at the, at the process. As we said, clients and server, they will uh, exchange several times these models. And these models mean lots of parameters. And this means a high cost in terms of bandwidth consumption. But let me just give you a quick um, idea of the performance issues and problems that we may have due to non-ID data, just because I think that uh, it is also interesting and useful let's say, to underline the fact that uh, machine learning is not necessarily something that can uh, should be looked at as black box, but there are some analytical works that actually try to characterize the behavior of these models. In this case, um, these analytical works uh, aim at finding bounds on the quality, essentially, of the training. 
for example, and uh, explain us and uh, represent the impact of the non-ID data that are used for the training on the training quality. So um, I don't want to go in, into many details, but just to give you a rough idea of what they, they mean. So here we have the loss uh, function, actually the expected value of the loss. That is essentially the error that we make uh, during, during training. And uh, the difference between uh, the expected loss that we get with respect to the optimal value that is the F star. So we can think of F star being uh, zero, right? So the error essentially that we would like to have at the end of the training uh, ideally would be zero. Um, so what is the difference between what we get and what we would like to have? So, this is quantified, let's say, by this bound um, that holds, uh, in particular, also when data are non-ID. So the nodes, the clients, for example, use data sets that are non-ID. Uh, let me stress that this K is the number of epochs. So this is quite, oh, sorry, quite straightforward. Um, as the number of epochs increases, so the more we train the model, the better. So the, the lower essentially the final error that we get. But as you can see, there are many, many factors in this, in this bound, many coefficients. And I would like to draw your attention to in particular to this gamma and to this uh, sigma squared. Why? Because gamma indeed accounts for the diversity uh, among the, the data sets that the clients use locally. Um, so clearly the more diverse these data sets are and the slower essentially the convergence. So uh, let's say the more difficult is to reduce this error during, during training. Um, just one, one note, um, since this gamma actually depends uh, on the optimal local loss, it is a bound that is useful to understand the behavior of the training process, but it's not that easy to be computed uh, a priori. Uh, ideally, we like, of course, bounds that we can compute uh, a priori in order to drive our uh, training process. Uh, sigma squared also is useful because it accounts for the quality of the each local data set. And essentially, uh, when the local data set includes many outliers, then we have that the, 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 the convergence of the training gets worse. So this bound essentially helps us to focus on what are the, some of the main aspects that affect the training of a machine learning model. And in particular, the impact, the relevance that the data set distributions and the characteristics of the data that we are using during training uh, have. Um, Quickly, I'd like to, to just mention that besides bounds that characterize the training process, uh, there are bounds also that instead refer to the uh, testing phase. So whenever we have trained a model and we want to verify how good uh, the model has learned so far. So in that case, we test the model with another data set. And uh, of course, with samples that the model has not seen earlier. And uh, we characterize, we quantify the error that the model makes in processing these new data samples, essentially. And um, what we have in the literature uh, are also in this case, some interesting uh, bounds that give you an idea of the error that we get during this testing phase. 
And again, these bounds account for the characteristics of the data that are used by the clients that are involved, that have been involved in uh, the uh, training phase. And uh, let's say on the fact that uh, if we neglect some of the of the clients, we can uh, we may actually neglect some of the data sets. So in a way, uh, whenever we uh, identify certain possible clients to be involved in the federated learning uh, process, well, it means that we are going to include the data of those clients and instead we do not leverage the knowledge um, that belongs to other clients that have been excluded from the process. So this is interesting because it opens, uh, let's say, the, the issue of how to select the clients to be involved in a federated learning process. And uh, what these bounds essentially say is that, well, these clients should be uh, selected, not just based on the resources, computational resources that they own, that's important, of course, but also on the data sets that they own. That's extremely important from the point of view of the quality, essentially, of the training process that we are uh, performing. Um, so I don't want to bother you too much, of course, with the details, but I hope that you um, can find these, these uh, results interesting. And of course, I reported the references so that uh, uh, if interested, you can look at the papers and the details reported there. But let me move on to the third aspect that is network overhead. And we said, well, this is indeed a very important issue in a distributed learning because whenever we let different nodes interact, they will exchange data and for example, during training, um, if they have to exchange the model parameters, that's a lot of it. So we need to uh, envision some techniques that allow us to reduce the amount of information that in distributed learning nodes need to exchange. Um, very simple approach, quantization. Well, that's probably the uh, most intuitive methodology that one can, can use, uh, but the specific method uh, through which you can apply quantization actually may vary significantly. It ranges from the simplest quantization uh, techniques, the most straightforward one, to more, let's say, complicated advanced techniques that on the turn uh, use uh, machine learning and uh, um, they can essentially reconstruct the parameters of a model uh, at the receiver starting from some uh, part of the information. Uh, other approaches, parameter sampling. So essentially, uh, again, you sample only the most relevant uh, values and neglect the others. And third, model compression. And I would like to spend a few words on this last uh, two essentially uh, mechanisms that have been that have been applied. Um, so quantization and model compression. Um, quantization, as I said, is in general uh, quite straightforward whenever applied in the simplest uh, way. However, it has been observed that um, quantization is more effective whenever it is applied during training. So um, if quantization techniques are incorporated into the training process, then uh, that's, let's say, much more convenient. However, 
uh, if we let's say exceed or or uh, exaggerate let's say uh, in uh, quantizing the parameters then we may affect again the convergence of the training process and here you have a, a graphical representation of what may happen whenever we indeed um, quantize the parameters of, of the model um, for reducing the bandwidth consumption and for the other. So what may happen is that the quantized parameters may indeed change uh, sign and uh, this has a very heavy impact on the result of the convergence. So also let's say this area is an area where um, further research is needed and uh, uh, these um, issues are, are actually still open. Regarding model compression instead, that is the third method that we mentioned, um, this is also very interesting because what it says is that given, again, a model, um, where we have, as we mentioned, many layers, so many neurons and many connections uh, between neurons, uh, so quite complex, lots, lots of parameters. What we can do is to reduce the amount of parameters and therefore the other had during the distributed training process uh, by compressing the model. And the technique that is the simplest one, but also very, very effective, is pruning. So based, for example, on the magnitude of these parameters. So what we can say is that the parameters that are smaller than a given threshold will be considered as essentially zeros, and the corresponding edges will be removed. And then, of course, if a neuron is not connected to any other neuron, any longer than it can be removed. And in this way, we can obtain a model that is even much, much smaller than the original full size model. So these compressed versions are really lighter to be exchanged between our clients and the server during the distributed training, but also whenever we need to execute to use the train model will have a model that is, let's say, more compact and therefore, uh, uh, let's say, much uh, lighter uh, and require, will require less computational resources. Um, just to underline the fact that what we uh, stress as possible issues for uh, um, the training, the distributed training, the distributed learning uh, phase uh, are there also in the case of distributed inference. So whenever we use the model, we can actually um, apply the same approaches uh, like distributed inference thanks to split computing. But of course, we have also similar issues. So let me highlight that through an example. In this case, we are considering a DNN that is used for, um, for example, object uh, detection or object recognition. And uh, we can consider that this DNN has been uh, split into parts head and tail, so the head is the smaller portion that can be run, executed at uh, UAV, while the tail is the more complex part that can be executed at the edge server. So the frames will be captured by a camera that is on the UAV, and this will be the input to the DNN head. And then if we want to get a high accuracy result, we need actually to use also the tail of the DNN at the edge server. So in this case, we are using an already trained DNN to classify essentially uh, the frames of a video captured by the camera of a UAV. 
But if we want to exploit the DNN tail at the edge, then we need the UAV to send the intermediate output of the head of the DNN, that is a tensor, toward the edge server. And this needs to be through the wireless channel and the coordinate. So again, we are applying split computing. We are splitting indeed the computational load between the UAV that has lower capability and the edge server that has larger capability. But the problem, for example, again, is this sensor that needs to be transmitted and the network overhead that this will imply. So what we will need to do is actually to try and find a way to compress as much as possible this tensor. But at the same time, of course, we cannot lose too much information by compressing that. And there is a, clearly a trade-off uh, between bandwidth, um, let's say, saving and the amount of information that we are sending to the edge server and the possibility to reconstruct therefore the tensor properly in order to let this DNN tail uh, process this tensor and at the end have a high accuracy classification of the uh, frames. That said, uh, let me move to the uh, second and last part of this talk uh, that is about um, not just cooperation, but also this uh, interesting and fascinating concept that is dynamic neural networks. So these are a couple of works where we have actually exploited both cooperation and dynamic neural networks. So let me just say what dynamic neural networks are in simple terms. Dynamic neural networks are still neural networks, of course. Uh, you can consider a deep neural network, um, but the uh, let's say property, the main idea here is that given a certain input, not necessarily we need to use all the blocks, all the portions of the, the, the deep neural network. We can actually select uh, only those blocks that need to process a given input sample. And therefore, what we need is an external logic, the so-called gate module, uh, that determines, depending on the input sample, what are the blocks of this neural network that should be activated in order to process this, this data. And clearly the advantage is that by selecting only those blocks that really need to process those data, we reduce the amount of computation and therefore the um, usage of computing resources and clearly energy resources as well. So this is a quite powerful uh, concept. Here we have probably the most popular uh, structure uh, or type of dynamic neural network that is a backbone where we have blocks of layers. And in this network, you can see that uh, uh, there are uh, several possible uh, exits. So depending now on the data that we get in input and the level of accuracy, for example, that we want to achieve during a classification task, uh, we may let essentially the processing or uh, yeah, the execution of the neural network be terminated at exit one, or instead, if we want a higher level of accuracy in your classification output, you can go on to exit two or exit three. And clearly, if we exit at exit one, it means that we um, activated only the first block of layers, and we had clearly uh, reduced consumption of resources. So what we did was to exploit this idea in order to be able to cope with the heterogeneity of our devices. 
because as we said, not all devices, not all nodes that are involved in a process of the machine learning pipeline uh, have the same characteristics and the same capability. So what we wanted to do is to exploit this concept of dynamic neural networks and in particular uh, the structure that we saw before with the several exits, the so-called every exits, and determine what are the data sources that should provide input samples, which blocks of our neural networks should be activated, uh, used, and therefore deployed, on which nodes and how many resources, computational, for example, resources and bandwidth resources we should use um, to uh, let these blocks be executed. So the idea is that we have our uh, uh, heterogeneous network computing system uh, with mobile nodes, edge servers, or cloud servers, and there is an orchestrator that will orchestrate indeed the inference process, because in this case, we focused only on the inference uh, stage. And as you can see, we may have several applications that are running on our nodes, and we should identify for each application that exploits a neural network as I said, which blocks essentially are executed at which nodes in the network and computing system. So it is the orchestrator that should make these decisions and then, of course, orchestrate the inference process. The objective is to minimize energy consumption energy consumption due to computing as well as data transfer. So in order to let the orchestrator uh, make the right decisions, we developed a model of the system where we account for both the computing and networking resources, as well as the structure of the neural network. So the blocks and the axes that we described earlier. And what we developed was a two-plane graph that then were, was actually transformed in a one plane graph. And from there, we could build the graph representing all possible decisions. We pruned, of course, those decisions that were unfeasible. And at this point, by defining essentially uh, clearly the, the weights of the edges associated with the edges of these um, graph that you can see at the bottom, uh, we can just identify the best decision by selecting what is the shortest path on the graph. So very, very simple from the computational point of view. And uh, what we got were actually very good results uh, comparing with state of the art. Essentially, we were able to reduce the energy consumption by a significant percentage. Uh, ranging between 65 or 70 percent, and that was indeed a very significant improvement. And uh, we were able, therefore, to deploy more applications. So the failure probability of deploying an application, of course, is much less when we apply our approach with respect to the benchmark. And uh, from the plot on the right, you can see that essentially uh, the uh, solution that we envisioned that we call the FIN um, was actually the, the uh, main advantage is to identify the best essentially place where to deploy the different blocks of our neural network by exploiting uh, even essentially conveniently the resources at the mobile, at the edge, and at the cloud. So let me just wrap up and comment a bit on what I think are uh, interesting research directions. Uh, so to wrap up, um, machine learning, as we know, is a great approach, uh, very promising in many contexts, not always, but in many, many cases. The fact that machine learning is becoming pervasive, of course, 
has an impact on our networking and computing uh, systems and platforms, and, and we need to make machine learning sustainable. Um, so one way to do that and to um, meet, to satisfy the requirements of machine learning based applications and services is to use resources at the edge. Um, that will allow us to have indeed real time processing and to reuse resources that already exist. But in order to essentially fill the gap uh, between the complexity of these models and the amount of resources that edge devices can offer, we need to exploit cooperation. That's something intuitive. What we claim is that uh, leveraging cooperation is certainly a very good solution associated perhaps with split computing, but it is um, very important uh, also to account for the structure of the machine learning models. So not just use them as a black box, but look into the structure of the neural networks and the different blocks that compose our neural networks and try to optimize their deployment and execution uh, considering the different resources that the network system can, can offer. And this is essentially what we did through our FIN approach that showed indeed um, very, very good solutions. But looking forward, uh, I think that really this uh, concept of dynamic neural networks is what will allow us to play with the structure of the um, neural network models and adapt them to the available resources. And in the end, therefore, contribute to making indeed machine learning more sustainable. The other very interesting technique is um, try and compress these models. That is, for example, use pruning, there are other model compression techniques that are indeed very interesting and can be um, exploited to tune essentially the complexity of the machine learning models to the resource availability. And uh, as, as mentioned, um, in order to address this uh, matching between network capabilities and dynamic neural networks, uh, it is possible, and actually we, we need to use analytical modeling and algorithmic solutions. That is nice because it allows us to look at these models as actually uh, not black boxes, as we were saying, but something we can understand and play with. And just as a very last comment, the other uh, dimension that I think is extremely interesting is to look at the data. So um, sensors are also all, all around as machine learning, and they are often generating samples that are input or can be input to our machine learning models. So um, try to optimize the use of these data becomes of paramount importance as we underlined also by looking at some analytical results on the bounds on the training and generalization error. So this is just to summarize some of the works that we need that I have co-authored on the, on the topic and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Carla. Very nice talk. Uh, we are a little above the time so plus you have this time limitation that you have to go for your class. There are a couple of questions. Plus we need time for the wisdom corner that Alessia will uh, moderate. So actually we should have enough time for her too. So there are two questions by Hesham. She say, uh, he says, how time synchronization uh, can improve the performance of the distributed machine learning. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, synchronization 
um, is important uh, whenever indeed uh, we need to recombine the locally trained models um, so that we know essentially when um, we will receive the input from the different clients and we can uh, recombine them together. Um, so if we are able to synchronize the operation of the different clients or the different nodes that participate in the distributed uh, process, that helps very significantly because clearly whoever needs to aggregate the different versions it would uh, actually need to be sure that he got all uh, the versions that he needs to aggregate, right? So how can we do that? If the nodes are synchronized in a, in a, in a way, uh, then uh, the process can proceed smoothly. Otherwise, it is indeed a challenge. There are some techniques that have been proposed uh, for uh, in need to address this issue called uh, asynchronous uh, federated learning in the specific case of federated learning, but similarly for distributed uh, learning. So you can, uh, for example, uh, establish a deadline within which, of course, you aggregate whatever you have, you have received, uh, but it would be more sensible to understand what are the um, uh, input from the clients that are more valuable and be sure to wait long enough to receive those well, valuable uh, inputs. So uh, it is not so the, 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 the best solution, I say that it is not so straightforward to, to find and to implement. Okay, thank you. There is also another question by Youssef Iraqi. He says, thank you for the presentation. Uh, how do you decide where to split the DNN? Right. So then that's indeed a very, very uh, challenging uh, uh, aspect because it depends on the availability of the resources uh, and the different nodes. Uh, you essentially need to uh, tailor the portions of the neural network to the availability of the resources of the nodes. And that, that's part of establishing this matching that I was, this match that I was referring to uh, between the resources in the network system and the dynamic neural networks. That is to understand how to split the neural network uh, and, and match the block complexity with uh, the resources of the nodes. So yeah, that's indeed, I think, a very interesting uh, direction for future work also. We try to do that in, in, in our work, but for sure that's an open open area, yeah. Yeah, but actually I was planning to uh, cut off this Q&A session when there's an interesting question by Elisea. In the context of, but please short answer because Elisea yeah. is waiting for you. In the context of dynamic neural network, perhaps I missed what a block is. I understood it as a module, what level of granularity, single neurons or groups of neurons, how organized in layers. Can it happen that one disables a block that is a bottleneck and interrupt the flow from input to output? How to avoid all of this? So yeah, a block is uh, typically considered to be a set of uh, consecutive layers. Very short answer. Okay. Okay, Alessia. So I'm sure you want to start. Thank you so much. No worries. Thank you thank so you. much, Ian, for moderating this session. And thank you, Professor Carla Chiesterini, for this interesting presentation. I uh, will move quickly to the Wisdom Corner, uh, which is designed to add the personal touch to this series of webinars. Uh, I would only ask uh, two questions, as I know you have to leave for your classroom. Uh, so my first question is, uh, which is your uh, hard-earned life lesson or failure that you would like to share with us that might perhaps uh, be helpful for someone attending this webinar? 
Thank you, thank you, Alessia. So, yeah, uh, I uh, failed several, several times. <laughs> so, as we know, um, it is it is important to keep going and not look back too much. Um, but from the what kind of failure do you, do you have in your mind, just to give us an example? Um, well, I, I failed. Uh, of course, in in getting, for example, very ambitious grants or uh, or awards or you know you try, but um, and then sometimes, of course, you fail. Often I fail, and um, the 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 important thing is that uh, uh, yeah, not 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 to be afraid for sure. <laughs> And uh, it is tiring, you know, to, for example, submit your CV for something or to apply or to submit a paper and, and getting rejected or in any way is frustrating. But at the same time, uh, what is important is, is really to, um, you know, have this um, um, resilience in a way, right? And, and uh, always look forward and look at things uh, that make you happy, that can be also to transfer whatever you know to students, to PhD students, or uh, like these kind of events, exchange ideas with other people, uh, work with other people. And uh, also in that, in that case, one may fail, not always, of course, you work well with everyone. <laughs> but... Um, I think that it's important to understand what uh, makes you happy and try to, to focus your energies and attention on, uh, on that. Thank you. And the second and last today question uh, is basically almost the opposite of the first one. So if you could tell us, if you could share with us uh, one of the most tangible contributions that uh, you have made in your career that had a direct impact on your life or another's life uh, that you're most proud of? So, yeah, I am actually, um, after my, my PhD, this, this is, let's say, the, the result in research that I probably love the most. Uh, I studied cooperation. That's why I was also very emphasizing cooperation in my talk. Uh, the the how the network nodes can cooperate, right? And uh, why? Because in that case, I had the possibility to apply what are human dynamics and how humans let's say interact to the networks of of nodes and try to get inspiration actually from from that uh, to design uh, algorithmic solutions that have been indeed quite quite successful and that have inspired uh, research of of other people and actually to to tell you the story uh, i was on a plane going to san diego and i watched a movie where uh, there was indeed a kid that, that started essentially a process with neighbors and friends and so that one uh, would help the other and, and so on. And I, I thought, well, this could be done actually in it working as well. And that's mm -hmm. essentially how my work on cooperation in wireless, distributed wireless networks started. So uh, that's my, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I really got inspiration from the human behavior uh, to design networks. And Wonderful. Thank networks. you so much for sharing that. Uh, uh, thank you again, Ian. We'll say just a few words to close this webinar so that Professor Chiaterini can go to her students now. Thank you. Thank you very <laughs> thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much again. And uh, we'll uh, we'll be connected again, Ian, on the on the fourth of June with Professor Medi uh, for our next webinar. Sure. It's like we have another month, right? Which is yep. good. Exactly. Space out. Yeah. So uh, I thank you and also, of course, the team as well as our attendees. I hope you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed it, tell everybody they can uh, get it from our website. They can yeah. watch it later on. And we have many other webinars that uh, you're yeah. welcome to. Full uh, month of June, actually. Yeah. yeah. We Now, but also like the past ones, if they want to watch them, they're all on our website. They're free mm -hmm. of charge. So hopefully uh, we'll see you in one month. Plus, if you have any feedback about our webinars, 
please let us know so that we can always improve, make you and the attendees more happy. Yeah. So, Carla, ciao. Uh, Carla already run away Carla because she okay. has to teach. Thank you so much. Thank you. Much. Thank Thank you, you. everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye.